I consider myself a foodie. My wife would probably disagree. Um, I like street food. I like comfort food from all sorts of cultures and societies. But I'm also a political scientist. <clears throat> I study war, I study strategy, I study international security. Uh, what's the old saying, an army marches on its stomach? That's very true. The last 20 years has seen a remarkable development in military rations. They reflect now, generally, what we as a society like to eat. We don't think of them as uh, an intersection of technology and culture and society, but they are. Different countries now have the ability to have rations that match their culture. And this is a big deal. If you're in the field, if you're spending two weeks, three weeks a month in the field as a soldier, you want some sort of comfort food. The Canadians, if for example, have poutine. The Russians have uh, borscht, uh, buckwheat, kasha, and of course, mystery meat. <laughs> the French have ostrich and cranberry sauce and wild boar. That's a very French-looking ration to me. The Australians, of course, have, see that little brown tube? Vegemite. I happen to love Vegemite, so I'd be very happy with that. Now, as Americans, we have landed on the moon. We've harnessed the atom. But for many people, the greatest American achievement is this. The shelf-stable pepperoni and cheese pizza, introduced new for 2019, menu 23, MRE case B. This pizza has been in development for almost 30 years. <laughs> At least a million dollars has been spent on this development. This is the holy grail of MREs. You still can't find them right now. They're hard to find because people grab them up. They want them. Now, we've come a long way for the first two-thirds of the US military's history and many other militaries. The most common food was the stuff that you could take with you. Hard pack, which if you've never had it, is flour, water, mix it into a paste, and bake it for a couple hours. Yes, it's as hard as a rock. Coffee, of course, is the American staple. Uh, another staple is salt pork. You can't really refrigerate meat in the 19th century, so what do you do? You salt it up. There's some hardtack for you. I, uh, I baked some hardtack almost 20 years ago. I still have some. And it's still perfectly edible. Um, just to give you an example of just how long this stuff can stay in storage. But this is not, this is not at, at worst, this food is inedible. At best, it's just not palatable. And so uh, many militaries, especially the U.S. military, uh, sought ways to make their food better. And we're going to talk about the K-ration. In the 1930s, the Army used science to develop a series of rations. Uh, a was fresh rations, fresh food. B was bulk packaged stuff like flour. C was canned pre-prepared food like beef stew. And then there's the D ration, which was the emergency ration. It was a chocolate bar, heat resistant. You ever had baker's chocolate? Did you ever make that mistake when mom was cooking? <laughs> That's what it tastes like. It's not good. It was designed so the soldier wouldn't want dessert one day. He, so he wouldn't eat that. So early in World War II, the Army realizes it needs something lightweight, compact, for frontline usage. And so they developed the K-ration. The K-ration is exactly that. It's lightweight. It's small. In fact, the Army des uh, designed a pair of uh, work trousers with a pocket that you could put the K-ration in. And there it is. The K-ration had breakfast, lunch, and dinner options. There was a can of meat, 
Uh, the one in the picture is chopped ham and eggs. Yum. Crackers, either graham crackers for breakfast or regular crackers for dinner. Gum, a fruit bar of some sort. And of course, cigarettes. It's the 40s. Um, the K ration was remarkable. The US Army is the only military during World War II to really use uh, prepackaged, uh, off the shelf food designed for the frontline soldier. A couple of problems, though. Very limited variety. Uh, if you're in the field for months at a time, you know, chicken, tuna, beef, chicken, tuna, beef, chicken, tuna, beef. Um, another big problem is calories. The K ration didn't have enough calories for your active frontline soldier. So after World War II, the Army went back to cans. And the problem with variety is that makes rations heavy, very heavy. Uh, you ever towed around a case of Chef Boyardee? That's what you're looking at. It's not light. In Vietnam, actually, um, uh, they would use, uh, soldiers would take a sock, put cans in it, and dangle it from their backpack. That doesn't sound very comfortable. This is what we're talking about, the meal combat individual, or the MCI. Beef slices with potatoes in gravy, yum. The MCI came with a uh, main meal, a nut roll of some sort, uh, or in this case, fruitcake. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Middle of the jungle, fruitcake. <laughs> and an accessory pack of chocolate and crackers. Oh, and cigarettes. Never forget that. Um, these didn't taste that great. In fact, one, one canned meal for the MCI was ham and lima beans. The, most soldiers had a nickname for that, ham grenades. You could throw it at the enemy. It'd be just as deadly. So how do you improve on taste? Well, you got a couple of different ways. Cigarettes and Tabasco. Uh, this is your typical accessory pack from a pre-1973 MCI. Yes, after 1973, the Army realized that including cigarettes with every ration was probably not the best option. Uh, so you get your cigarettes, your coffee, your salt, and see that little brown square at the top? Your toilet paper. And Tabasco. We all recognize the little, the little baby bottles, right? Um, <laughs> In the mid-1960s, the uh, CEO of Tabasco's parent company, he had been a, he's a former general, and he actually um, sent out a cookbook to the troops in Vietnam about how to make your sea rations more palatable. Um, I've looked through the recipes, and I don't really know how you'd cook any of them in the field. <laughs> um, but it's a popular book, I've, I've read it several times. But yeah, they, they were desperate to try to get some Tabasco sauce out there. An alternative ration in the Vietnam War era is called the Long Range Patrol Ration. Now this is actually kind of cool. It uses freeze-dried off-the-shelf food. If you're a hiker, you're probably familiar with a, a mountain house and things like that. And that's what this is. They use commercial off-the-shelf stuff. And so it's tasty. You can get lasagna, spaghetti, beef teriyaki. Uh, the problem is though, the problem is the one big problem with this is it needs large amounts of water. Um, and that can be a problem if you're a frontline in the field soldier, is finding large amounts of potable water to, re, uh, to rehydrate your ration with. And so it's a good idea, but it's not the best idea. So in the late 1970s, the U.S. Army uh, starts developing um, what we know today as the MRE, the meal ready to eat. Uh, and this is the dawn of the retort pouch. The retort pouch, and we've all seen retort pouches at the grocery store. They are a pouch made of plastic and aluminum, uh, they are an alternative to canned food. They're lighter weight. You can put more varieties of food in them. Uh, um, they hold up better, generally. And so the U.S. Army developed this in order to replace all those cans. And because the retort pouch is more flexible, it gives a, a greater variety of foods to enter into the system, which is a godsend for your frontline soldier. 
Uh, here's one, Mexican chicken stew. The MRE is designed to, um, you can put uh, uh, the main dish, your side dish, your dessert, your accessory pack, your beverage, your coffee, Reese's Pieces. You're in the middle of nowhere and you open up your MRE and you get Reese's Pieces. How awesome is that, right? Unless they're 30 years old, which has happened. MREs technically have a shelf life of three years. But um, I've personally seen people open ones that are 30 years old, and they're still good. That's neat. Of course, you can't get this stuff fresh. MREs are, to say they're engineered and heavily processed is probably an understatement on my part. Because you're not just looking for, uh, you're not just looking to preserve taste, you're also looking to inject nutrition into it. Give, uh, give uh, soldiers on the front line their vitamins and their minerals. So um, these are naturally, you don't want to read the ingredient list, is what I'm trying to say. A lot of MREs are built. What do I mean by that? Um, it's, like, um, it's like a value meal at a restaurant. They try to build, you know, you can make a ration into, say, a sandwich. You can make it into something else. That's actually kind of cool. I'll give you an example right here. The jalapeno beef patty. Now, on its own, it looks a little weird. But they give you two, count them, two slices of shelf-stable bread. It even looks like white bread. They give you ketchup and mustard and the holy grail. There's one thing, if you ask any veteran or any serving soldier about the MRE, the holy grail is jalapeno cheese spread. It looks like it came out of a nuclear reactor. But trust me. If you ever get your hands on some, you'll thank me. You put that all, you put that all together, and bam, you have a bacon cheeseburger with M&Ms. You can't beat that. One side effect of a lot of this, though, and hence my title, is that oftentimes extended use of MREs in the field can use, leave the user rather constipated. That's an issue that can either be good or bad. And here's an example of the retort pouch commercially. It's, uh, it's everywhere now. Our tuna comes into it. Our Bombay potatoes come in, uh, in a retort pouch. This technology has revolutionized both military and commercial food. Now, let's talk about that intersection again of technology, society, and culture. Um, artist Jason Kofke out of Gainesville, Florida, coined a term for it, and I like this term, future uncertain. Pizza's the best example of this. We wanted a pizza for comfort food for soldiers in the field. And so technology interacted with society and culture to make that happen. It took a while, but it happened. Most advanced nations have done the same thing with their rations. They have, this, they have food that is considered a cultural norm for comfort food. And that's what future uncertain is, that intersection of society and culture and technology. Now if they could just find a way to prevent Skittles from melting together, that would really be good. I'm gonna leave you with this, the humble pizza. Is it the best pizza in the world? No, I've tried it. Um, but if I'm in the field for a month and I want a little taste of home, this thing is great. This thing is the best thing ever. Why? Because of that, again, that intersection. That culture and technology, it, inter it, it comes together. And so, again, rations, they do reflect. They are able now to reflect what we like as a society. And that's a pretty big leap. Like this says, the future holds outcomes that are often unpredictable, and the next step of rations will most likely tie them closer to the society they reflect. I don't know how you're going to top the pizza, but it has to be out there. I know they have burger in a can. I'm not so sure about that, though. So maybe that'll be the next, uh, the next go around, a fully functional hamburger in a retort pouch. Well, I don't know what technology, I don't know what the future holds, but it's bright. Thank you.